Well, a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining this morning. Welcome to the Sufan Center. My name is Noreen Chowdhury Fink. I am the executive director and very pleased to be one of the co-authors of the report that we're launching today. Um, I'm delighted to share that hot off the press, our new report is now available online, A Perfect Storm, Insurrection, Incitement, and the Violent Far-Right Movement. Um, if you haven't yet had a chance to read it in the 45 minutes that it's been live and online, cover to cover, um, it, I'll tell you very quickly, it focuses on the dynamics of right-wing violence and terrorism in the United States and the United Kingdom. And while these groups are often considered as domestic security challenges in many countries, our report highlights the transnational dimensions of their relationship and the implications of stronger ideological, financial, and operational cooperation among groups on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and finally, our report looks at some of the domestic and international measures taken to address these groups and identifies 10 action-oriented policy recommendations. So yes, there will be a follow-up test to see how far we've gone on implementation a little further down the line. Drawing on lessons learned from both the United States and the United Kingdom, as well as the international efforts through the United Nations and other international platforms, the report also notes that each country's respective far-right movements will be impacted by developments in the other. And I think that relationship is something that will continue to color our discussions on this going forward. But with that, it gives me great pleasure uh, to say that the report is now available for you to read. And for first and foremost, thanking the Airy Neve Trust, represented today by Hugh Tilney and Tim Wilson, for supporting this project. To my co-authors, Colin Clark and Molly Salzkog, for, for working on getting this together um, and for the Herculean efforts uh, in putting out the report. Um, and certainly to Vidya Ramalingam for joining us today and for her invaluable feedback uh, on earlier drafts. But I've, I've given out a lot of names without properly introducing them. So let me backtrack for a second and let you know who's joining us today. Colin Clark is the Director of Policy and Programs at the Sufan Group and a Senior Research Fellow at the Sufan Center. Molly Salzkog is a senior intelligence analyst at the Sufan Group and a research fellow at the Sufan Center. Vidya Ramalingam is founder and CEO of Moonshot, which focuses on ending online harms and applying ethics and human rights. <coughs> Sorry, to countering violent extremism. Um, so with that, I'm going to just go ahead and get started. We'll, we'll have an interactive discussion. You'll have a chance to hear from all our panelists. But before I go into question and answers and start um, talking to Molly, Colin, and Vidya about some aspects of the report, it gives me great pleasure to turn over the floor or the virtual screen over to Hugh Tilney on behalf of the Airy Neve Trust. Hugh, the screen is yours. I'll give that a second. Hugh, just wanted to check in if you're still joining us. Is there a second ago? Okay, well, maybe what we could do is go ahead and get started in our discussions. Oh, there we go. There's Hugh joining us. Hugh, you have the screen. We look forward to hearing from you about the Airy Neve Trust. Good morning, everybody. My name is Hugh Tilney, and I am the Vice Chairman of the Air and Eve Trust. I'll give you a few words in a moment about the Trust. But first and foremost, I'd like to congratulate the Sufan Center for a really wonderful report, and we are thrilled with the outcome of our sponsorship. The Air and Eve Trust was formed in Irish memory in 1979, shortly after his assassination by Irish terrorists. Air and Eve was a lawyer, soldier, war hero, author, and politician. He was the first British officer to escape from Kolditz Castle, a prisoner the Germans claimed to be escape proof. After his return to England via Switzerland, Southern France, and Spain, he joined MI9, a unit working to rescue Allied troops stranded behind enemy lines in Europe. At the end of World War II, Airy played a significant role at the Nuremberg trials. He, handled the, he handed the indictments to each defendant personally, and assisted them in finding defense counsel. In 
After the trial, Larry became a conservative member of parliament. He also wrote several books recounting his war experiences. In 1975, he ran Margaret Thatcher's campaign to take over the leadership in opposition of the Conservative Party. As a result of this success, he was offered any cabinet post that he wished in a future Conservative government. To the surprise of many, he chose the Northern Ireland portfolio, an area he had covered in opposition and an area which was front and foremost in British politics at the time. Airy held the strong belief that the UK should reinstitute the death penalty for acts of terrorism. It was for this reason that the Irish National Liberation Army placed a balance bomb in his car, which exploded as he exited the House of Commons car park on the afternoon of March 30th, 1979. On May 4th, 1979, the Conservatives were returned to power, sadly without Airy in the Cabinet. The objectives of the Airy Neve Trust are to give financial support for writings, lectures and seminars dealing with all forms of terrorism and extremism. Among my fellow trustees are our chairman, Lord Abuthnot, who, when he was a member of parliament, was chairman of the House Commons Defence Committee. We also have Sir David Vaness. David was a had a distinguished career as a senior police officer at Scotland Yard, dealing with negotiations uh, in terrorist actions. He negotiated the end of the siege of the Iran embassy in London in May 1980. After his police uh, time, he went to the United Nations as Under Secretary General for Security. Another trustee is Sir Kevin Tebbit, the former head of the UK's GCHQ. There's an excellent biography of Erin Eve written by Patrick Bishop and published in 2019. The title is The Man Who Was Saturday. Saturday was Erin's code name at MI9. Thank you, and I look forward to the rest of the webinar. Hugh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, not only to the trust, but to the very important legacy um, of Airy Neve. Uh, with that, I will turn now to my, to my co-authors and panelists. And let me get started with Molly. Um, in the report, we used 1-6 or January 6th as a starting point of reference to look back on the broader far right movements in the US, You know how that developed, how we got to where we are today. Can you share a few reflections on the path to the insurrection and the current far right landscape in the US? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Noreen. I think it's worthwhile to start uh, by noting that from a historical analysis perspective, the far right extremist movement has fluctuated in its acuteness as a threat in the United States. Um, but what we've seen uh, in the 21st century um, over the past decade is that there's been a resurgence of extremism and terrorism under the banner of far right ideologies um, to the point where it's now assessed by both experts inside and outside of government to be the most acute and deadly terrorism threat to the US homeland today. And I think for those experts, both inside and outside of government, who's been studying the increase of the threat from far right extremism, the alarm bells were ringing way before January 6, frankly. Um, I'll give a couple of quick notes uh, to jog people's memories. Uh, the 2017 United Right rally, the 2018 Pittsburgh synagogue attack, the 2019 El Paso shooting are just a few examples of how deadly this threat has become in recent years here in the United States. And you look at FBI arrests, for example, of uh, what they, what US law enforcement labels as racially, uh, ethnically motivated violent extremism, which we would colloquially perhaps say white supremacy extremists that sits neatly within the umbrella of far right ideology between 2017 and 2020, those arrests tripled almost. So that gives you an idea of, of the brunt that law enforcement, what law enforcement has to deal with when it comes to this threat. So here comes January 6, which we decided to be the starting point of our study um, that, as you said, is half off the, uh, hot off the presses today. And I want to take one moment and just, this was a truly shocking event. Even if the alarm bells were ringing before, I think we were all shocked by witnessing what was happening. And I think it's very important to actually, for everyone listening in today, to remember what we saw that day, the symbolism, the gallows that were erected outside of the Capitol, 
the attacks on journalists covering this event, um, the crowd chanting to hang the then vice president of the United States and the brave men and women of, of the Capitol Police that got badly injured and some even lost their lives that day or in, day, or in the days that followed. And so we started by looking at, we wanted to discern in the study, what were some trends that we could see on the ground that day? So we looked at DOJ documents and other open source materials. And I wanna share three key takeaways uh, before, before we move on. And the first one is really, and, and this is a really important one. When we look at the actors on the ground that day that participated in violence, it really illustrates the diversity of the far right extremist threat in the US today. You know, we looked at um, by uh, June 30th, about 12% of those individuals uh, that have been arrested in connection to their activities on January 6th were part of formalized organizations like the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers that tend to get a lot of the media attention. But the rest were seemingly unaffiliated. They were driven by uh, conspiracy theories that motivated them to be there that day, like the QAnon conspiracy theories or other disinformation about the election. So this really tells you how the momentous task we have in really understanding and defining the threat because it's so diverse in nature. The second one that I wanted to share is that if we do look at the formalized organizations like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, they did play an important role in organizing for the violence that occurred on that day. And we also saw looking at legal documents that they coordinated well before January 6th. There were fundraising efforts by the Proud Boys months prior to travel to the event. Also um, in December of 2020, the Proud Boys were coordinating with Oath Keepers uh, ahead of January 6th. Um, and this echoes what we saw actually at the Unite the Right rally. There were a lot of what we thought were seemingly unaffiliated organizations that had not cooperated up until that point within the far right umbrella that actually um, were coordinating uh, in their violence in Charlottesville in 2017. So this is important for law enforcement and policymakers to think about as well. Um, and lastly, one thing that I want to note is the this disproportionate number of individuals who had some form of military experience from partook in the violence. Uh, George W, uh, sorry, uh, George Washington Program on Extremism had that at least 10% of those implicated in federal cases had military experience. That's a slightly overrepresentation of the 7% of US citizens that have some form of military experience. And what we looked at was if we look at the individuals who were part of the formalized organizations like the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys, more than 33% have active or former service members that were active or former service members. And this also illustrates that this is something that policymakers need to contend with because it gives a boon to these organizations, this tactical knowledge. I will, I will stop talking there, but one thing that I wanna note, because I know this is the discussion uh, going forward is we have seen the assessments come out since by the intelligence community, by DHS, by law enforcement here. And they're all kind of uniform in their assessment that January 6 may serve as a potential inspiration for more violence here in the homeland. And what our study shown that comes out today or that came out today is that it doesn't stop here because of the globalization of the movement. This is also true for far right extremists. They might be inspired by the capital insurrection by 1-6 in Europe, in the United Kingdom and, and further. And this is what I'm looking forward to discussing today. Thanks so much, Molly. That's a, a perfect segue. Uh, I'd like to turn to Colin uh, because we know there's a kind of Anglo-Saxon bucket forming in the far right milieu and that you know the US and the UK have had strong linguistic, historical and political bonds. And it'd be interesting to hear a bit how the movement has evolved there and where it stands today, Colin. You'd like to share yeah. some reflection. Thanks, Noreen. I'd like to first start by thanking um, Hugh and Tim and the Area Need Trust for their generous sponsorship of this project, uh, to uh, Vidya, as well as to Graham Macklin for providing uh, peer review and making this a much stronger paper. And of course, to uh, my colleagues, uh, to Molly, to Noreen, and to Amanda for bringing this to the finish line. Um, it's a great question. I think this this notion of an Anglo-Saxon milieu is is something that we've seen uh, 
uh, evolving over time. If, if you go back and look at ideological linkages, uh, the British far right has long looked to the United States for, for inspiration, uh, drawing intellectual support from American white nationalist William Pierce, the Turner Diaries, which has inspired uh, white supremacists and extremists the, the world over. Uh, we also have seen elements in the United States uh, that have looked to the UK for a sense of emerging trends when it comes to terrorism. Uh, after 1-6, uh, we, we see the situation changing. We see the pendulum swinging back in the other direction now, uh, where we've noticed the UK taking its cue uh, from what's happening across the Atlantic here in the United States. So it's that kind of back and forth and this continuous ebb and flow between extremists on both sides uh, of the ocean that's giving cause for concern. And this came out in a lot of the really excellent interviews. And, and I should thank all of our uh, interviewees that spent time with us, folks from the intelligence community, policymakers, and others in both the US and the UK um, that have spoken at length with us about what they're seeing happening in real time. Um, we've seen tracks published in the US or practical motivation with certain British and American violent extremists um, and entities that are looking to lead coalitions of uh, like-minded individuals. Uh, and we've seen international actors directly branching out to other countries. After a year of lockdown and quarantine measures, which have exacerbated uh, isolation, anxiety, uh, folks you know, home spending way more time than they should be online, uh, we, we've seen some really uh, troubling trends emerge uh, from, from the COVID-19 pandemic, including a strengthening of linkages between uh, the far right in the US and in Europe. They've grown stronger uh, and this is something that came up again and again with our, uh, in our interviews with European counterterrorism officials. Um, we also had the, the pleasure to speak with Moonshot and Vidya's team, um, and they were uh, able to uh, speak with us about some of the things that they're seeing, some of the data and trends, um, and uh, what's been taking place on a lot of the for far right forums, um, particularly in the, you know, the days, weeks, and months after uh, January 6th and after the election. And we see uh, far-right extremists in the UK barring a lot of the same terminology, talking about the US election, um, talking about um, taking action on the streets, a lot of similar anti-Semitic narratives that have creeped into this conversation that may not have been uh, as visible prior. Uh, and then we've seen this dovetail with a number of other forms of extremism and conspiracy, not least of which is the QAnon conspiracy uh, which is you know, now taken hold in the UK, Canada, France, Norway, Germany, Iran, Japan, Russia, and elsewhere. Um, this has added uh, an additional layer to some of the, the challenges that we're facing here in the US uh, that, that are being faced in the United Kingdom, uh, Europe, as this conspiracy continues to take on a global dimension and spread worldwide. Um, our QAnon report from or earlier this year talks about some of the uh, ad, some of the U.S. adversaries at play and what they've done in amplifying this. Um, and, and then I'll close and, and just talk about, you know, when I have this conversation with folks, people say, well, where's the evidence? How do you know 1-6 is having an impact on the U.K.? Uh, we want to see the data, right? We want to see these trend lines. And I would just caution that we're, we're, we're still in the very early stages. It hasn't even been a year since January 6th. We are looking at the data, um, but we also recognize that there's a lag effect to these things. We're still in you know, COVID lockdowns in, in most parts of the world. And as lockdown begins to ease, as folks begin to travel more, uh, we're, we're expecting to see a lot more uh, networking between extremists in the US, in the UK, uh, a lot more pushing of these various brands of, of the groups. Uh, and we could potentially even see the emergence of, of new groups. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more later on in the webinar about some of the counterterrorism measures. But uh, suffice to say that the US and the, uh, the British have had a, a quite a different approach so far um, to tackling the threat, which is not necessarily the same when it comes to other forms of terrorism like Salafi Jihadism. There it's much more seen from the same sheet of music and, and we can get into some of the challenges uh, that result from that uh, later on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Colin. Um, Vidya, we we talked a little bit about Moonshot's work, and I know you know much of it focuses on online space. But you yourself have also focused a lot on the evolution of the far right in the UK and Europe. 
And it'd be interesting to see how you're seeing things evolve. What, what do you see as, as some of the most important developments in the space? Thanks, Noreen. And um, first of all, I, I want to thank the Supon Center for inviting me to join this conversation and also for um, what I think is a really important report um, and as and part of a, an important um, evolution of the relationship between the US and the UK as we're dealing with this particular threat. Um, so thank you so much for the report and to all the co-authors. Um, in terms of in terms of, of the evolution over the last several years, and, and I'll focus specifically on what we're seeing in the online space. We have to view January 6 within the context of what the last couple of years has looked like for the far right online. Since probably around 2019, we've been in the state of, we've been in multiple states of crisis globally. And yes, the pandemic is, of course, one of those crises, and it's had really practical implications for, for communication mechanisms across the US, UK, and globally. And just like many of us are dialing in today from living rooms and from homes and spending far more time on the internet, so have extremists. And your moonshot was tracking. Um, a notable increase over, over 2020 um, as the pandemic started to grow and, and um, as more and more people were online, we started to track a notable increase in attempts to access far-right extremist content, um, not only in the US, but in the UK and in other countries globally. I should also mention there that's not just the case for far-right extremism, but for other forms of extremism too. So just as we were all online, more extremists were online as well. We, we also tend to know that in the aftermath of attacks, violent attacks, and whatever scale attack, attack that might be, we've always tended to see spikes in engagement online. And that doesn't tend to just be domestically within the country of the attack itself. That tends to be something that happens on a global nature. So after Charlottesville um, in the United States, we saw a 400% increase in attempts to access white supremacy content. We saw a similar increase after Pittsburgh, after the Tree of Life attack. We saw another increase after El Paso. We saw an increase after Christchurch. Um, again, this isn't, this isn't just a, an increase based on what's happening domestically, but it once again shows the impact of global far-right events on those domestic communities. I guess perhaps the biggest change that we've seen in the last couple of years when it comes to far-right extremism online, which I think is important for, for us to contextualize January 6th, is the what I call the kind of blending and metastasization of several previously distinct, distinct groups and movements and ideologies, each with different motivations, which have increasingly over the last two years began, begun to merge and join forces. So the last year has seen far-right extremists and armed groups um, pushing messaging alongside anti-vaccination conspiracy theorists, election fraud conspiracies, and more. And with generally high levels of activity online across the board, this has become really dangerous and it's led to essentially the mainstreaming of conspiracy theories that once would have been really confined to niche spaces. So we're no longer dealing with the problem of niche far-right extremist movements. We're dealing with the, the mass spread of disinformation, which is then strategically used by these movements to further their objectives. And that obviously, it makes it even more challenging for us to respond online. It also means this is no longer, this no longer can be seen as a domestic, as solely a domestic issue. We have to be viewing this within the transnational context to be able to respond effectively. Thanks so much, Vidya, um, for that very alarming briefing. And I think, you know, as as we've talked about a little, it'll be interesting to see how the online activity translates into offline action, um, you know, and, and how resonant that is, I think, for, for how long that spike gets sustained or what keeps people coming back um, will be, you know, something something we, we track. Um, Molly, I'm going to turn to you for a second to build on the transnational element that Vidya just highlighted, and you certainly spoke about, you know, when you when you introduced um, your comments, and that is the fact that it is a transnational movement, and we need to start thinking about relationships between the groups and not just the groups kind of on their own. Um, and you've talked a lot about in the report about the proliferation of sort of online chapters, for example, of the Proud Boys, right? Um, it, it might be difficult to see how this online activity translates into these offline connections, but I think we know those already exist and it'd be really helpful to hear from you a little bit about the transnational linkages if you want to elaborate a bit on that. And I think um just noting briefly that before COVID, there was ample evidence of these transnational linkages between far-right ideologues, groups that were US-based but had affiliates in, in, in Canada, in Europe, in the UK, as far away as Australia, um, and even um, actually mostly at the height of the conflict in 2014, but there were Westerners who traveled 
um, who were adherents of far-right ideologies like white supremacy extremists who travel to partake in the fighting in Eastern Ukraine. So um, just like jihadis uh, in European uh, nationals travel to join ISIS in Syria or Iraq, we had that also on the far right side, but the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. And obviously after your lockdown quarantine measures, et cetera, we haven't seen that level of connectedness and activity, uh, but um, actually, European counterterrorism officials have said that the linkages between far right uh, in the U United States and Europe have grown stronger. And so we need to really um, be aware of this when the world starts opening up again. And a lot of the ideologues that are, are impactful in this movement are from the United States. Uh, they are traveling to Europe to participate in conferences. They were doing so before COVID, I should say, the pandemic. But so, but if we look at the online space um, uh, with this in mind, the, the transnational linkages that existed before January 6, and we look at the online space, um, Vidya gave a really great primer to that. I'll just give one example of how we could see direct implications um, of what happened on January, January 6 and how it provided a boon for, for the online um, far right movement. Um, first, we saw an increase, like Vidya mentioned, uh, an increase in, in, in the migration into more fringe corners of the internet. Uh, every single expert we spoke to uh, that works on monitoring this threat uh, in the online space told us that this was really uh, a, a mass migration that we saw. And, and sadly, uh, that makes it harder to surveil. Uh, it makes it harder to, to discern what, what is really going on and what the trends are. Um, as well. So it makes it harder for law enforcement in a way. And I'll give you an example. It was also for the international chapters, as you mentioned, for the Proud Boys. Uh, a lot of people think of the Proud Boys as, as a purely domestic organization, but they actually brag about having international chapters in Europe and elsewhere. And the UK chapter, um, their subscribers on, on, on their affiliated Telegram channel increased by nearly 35% in just one month following January 6. And they retained most of those subscribers. Now that doesn't equal membership, of course, but it tells you who sought out uh, that particular channel following January 6. It was, a, it was a large increase. And we also know that they participate in offline activity in the UK, um, doxing activists, uh, posting flyers, and they even fundraise through selling merchandise, some of which have arrived here in the United States, um, highlighting transnational, potential transnational financial linkages as well. Thanks. Thanks for that, Molly. And I think, you know, for, for those of you who haven't yet read the paper, which just came out, so I'm guessing that's the majority of you, um, we, we do look at this notion of linkages in sort of three different ways, you know, ideological, financial, and operational, because we recognize that saying that groups have linkages writ large doesn't really help us get at an actionable policy response. And so we've set out, you know, the ideological perspective, um, the, the financial potential linkages and the operational ones. Molly's already highlighted many of the ones we've seen in action, you know, long before COVID and long before 1-6 and that we are presuming and from everyone we've spoken with uh, seem to assume these will be picked up again when travel permits. Um, Colin, that, that brings me to this idea of how we're tackling the threat. Right. We, we've talked about these three layers of linkages. We've talked about increased activism you know, online, despite those warning bells that Molly talked about from, from most people we spoke with and, and what we've seen, it seems like in the UK, like, you know, much of the US, the threat of far right terrorism was, was sort of downplayed initially, you know, certainly jihadist violence, transnational groups are seen, you know, as, as the greatest threat. Um, but rather, you know, these were seen as kind of random acts of individual violence or quote unquote hooliganism and not really part of an organized movement, which is also what Molly alluded to. Um, we're starting to see it labeled much more as terroristic in nature. You know, the UK has been out front in proscribing far right groups as terrorists. Um, but you alluded a little bit earlier to the differences and commonalities in our counterterrorism approach. Can you talk a little bit about that side of it? Yeah, I can. And unfortunately, I think the differences um, are hampering the response. 
uh, and the similarities are things that I would consider negative. Um, so this was a theme that came up again and again in our interviews uh, with law enforcement and intelligence officials in both the US and the UK, um, which is this idea that, well, the far right's disorganized. They're really just a bunch of kind of soccer hooligans that drink too much and get in bar brawls and fist fights. And we know from studying it that that's far from it. And in fact, that gives cover for these groups, um, you know, not deliberately. They're just dismissed as uh, they're kind of a ragtag bunch of, you know, agitators. But if you think back to the way the United States looked at the jihadi threat prior to 9-11, I mean, you know, our founder, Ali Soufan, talks about trying to ring the alarm bells and people were not taking the threat seriously at the time. Um, and so I think there are some, some similarities there as well. We also become so focused and fixated um, on certain threats as opposed to others, right? We called it, you know, poorly named to be sure, but the global war on terrorism. And we really didn't mean all forms of terrorism. Uh, we meant a specific type of terrorism, Salafi jihadi terrorism. Um, and I think it's human nature that when you're hit so hard by an enemy as we were on 9-11, uh, as the UK was on 7-7 and, and multiple kind of smaller scale attacks, um, that it's, it's normal to, to react and kind of focus in and, and fixate. But we have to be able to see beyond the blinders. Uh, and so unfortunately in the US, you know, 1-6 was our wake up call, or we like to think that it was, but it shouldn't have taken the Capitol being stormed for policymakers and others to, to recognize that this was indeed a growing threat. I mean, you can molly rattle off a list earlier, but we can go back um, and, and, and you know, pick your example. 2012, when we had a shooting at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin, uh, the Charleston Church Massacre in 2015, Charlottesville in 2017, the Tree of Life shooting, which will mark the three-year anniversary of this very month. And you know, I was living, for, for many that know me, I was living in that neighborhood down the street from the synagogue when that attack happened in my house, writing about terrorism that happens in Somalia and Yemen and out there. Not Certainly not in the US, not in my neighborhood. Um, and, and there it is. So, uh, and, and then we can go on to El Paso and, and Poway. You know, there was, there was a lot of great feedback we got from our interviewees, but one quote above all stuck out to me. Uh, and that was a, a quote that was, nothing ever falls off the plate. And what that means is that uh, we very rarely are able to close out existing threats. We just have other ones that, that join. And that's kind of what's happening right now. And I, I get the sense that it's overwhelming because we're still in the nascent stages of dealing with the threat posed by far-right far, far violent extremism. We're still you know, debating definitions at this point. And it does feel very much like the earliest years in the post 9-11 era where we were saying, well, what is jihadism? Who, who's in this category? Who's not? Um, you know, much less building the infrastructure needed to actually go after these groups. Um, I, I think, you know, the US, the UK and allies were very tightly synchronized in terms of attacking the, the jihadi threat, um, in terms of designations, in terms of, you know, overall approach. And that's just not the case when it comes to the violent far right. Uh, there's far less agreement. There's a patchwork of designations. I mean, I have to give credit to the UK for being proactive in this space and getting out in front of the threat before it's able to metastasize to the point where it becomes uh, uncontrollable. And, you know, extremists recognize this. They know that there are differences in laws, authorities, and policies between the various countries. And in fact, they deliberately seek out those seams or gaps uh, to exploit, whether they're surrounding free speech or, or weapons in, in different countries. Um, and so uh, they're always thinking about how to take advantage of these, these gaps for their own benefit. Um, and they're doing so, again, to bring it back to the three buckets, ideological, financial, and operational. So even where you may make progress in one area, you, you know, it's, it's uh, one step forward, two steps back far too often. And that's kind of what we're trying to do with this paper, which is gather the universe of all the actions that have been taken uh, and look at them comparing the US and the UK and kind of see things where, uh, where things stand, but also where they need to be. Thanks very much, Colin. And of course, beyond the US and UK, our report does look at some of the international efforts that have been taken. You know, Colin mentioned the global war on terror, 
of course, sort of just a few days after 9-11 on the international side, this huge counterterrorism framework was driven through the UN, you know, through the Security Council, and we had this unique raft of binding, um, you know, counterterrorism obligations imposed on states. And I, and I think that the speed and force of that is really something quite unique in the multilateral space. And of course, it's centered on Al-Qaeda and IS-related terrorism. Um, and, and, you know, both the Council and the General Assembly have sort of developed this complex web of legislation, sanctions, obligations, measures. Um, but, you know, one of the things I hear quite often is that, well, you know, we can't use this to deal with right wing extremism. This is certainly Al Qaeda and ISIS focused for better, for worse. Much of it is not. There isn't a sunset clause and there isn't, again, for better, for worse, there isn't a limitation put on the application to certain groups. So we do share in the report a few thoughts on how um, if or how some of the existing multilateral instruments can be adapted to um, deal with the far right you know we don't we don't need to reinvent the wheel every time we have quite a lot of instruments at our disposal that can help harmonize some of those differences uh, that Colin mentioned because these are sort of globally binding um, instruments um, but but I do want to turn to video for a second um, and as we are talking about responses and solutions if you could talk to us a little bit about the kinds of solutions you've seen and, and what interventions you think have worked best. You know, we've, we've diagnosed the problem quite a bit. What, what can we do about it? Thanks, Noreen. Um, and, you know, in talking about solutions, there's actually a huge amount of learning that we can draw from, um, not only from the UK, but from across Europe. And I say that particularly when it comes to the US, which is actually a bit newer in the in the prevention space when it comes to um, domestic violent extremism or, or white supremacy or the far right. Um, some of the learnings which we should really be taking from the UK and, and Europe is that the most effective prevention mechanisms tend to involve behavior, behavioral health me methods. So essentially counseling message, methods, pulling someone into a one-to-one -one interaction, the sort of case management processes that can help to assess vulnerabilities in drivers and can then lead to referrals to other social services. And that's really become the cornerstone of most of the European programs that were set up even in the post 9-11 period, but also prior to that. Um, many of the programs to, to pull people out of neo-Nazi movements or far-right groups were actually set up in the 1990s and we're building on um, existing social service um, provision, but we're really drawing on that, that kind of behavioral health method. Um, but they also tend to be, these programs tend to be um, most effective when they're locally established um, and when they're run with substantive involvement from the, the communities and, and the local governments where they're deployed. Um, but another important learning, which is really re relevant as we, as we build up our, our processes to deal with far-right extremism is that these, these mechanisms, these response mechanisms don't necessarily need to be ideology focused. They can really span the ideological spectrum. And I think there's a temptation um, when we deal with any form of terrorism and when we're newer to dealing with any form of terrorism, there has always been a temptation to jump in and engage ideology and make this a kind of battle of the minds. And there's so much evidence. We now have a raft of evidence um, to show us that so often it's not even the ideology that pulls someone in first. There's often, oftentimes a range of underlying drivers which make an individual vulnerable. And if you can deal with those under, underlying vulnerabilities, you then can, can largely, you know, the ideology will largely just fall away. Um, one thing that I'll just mention here is as we, we've been talking a lot about the online space and a lot of what I just mentioned might be relevant for offline prevention mechanisms. We actually think that the same methods can apply in the online space. Um, this isn't just about us deploying counter narratives online and trying to tackle the ideology. We can also take a lot of those learnings around social work methods, behavioral health methods, and start to test those online with these audiences. And that's something that, that Moonshot's been doing for the last several years in our outreach to far-right extremist audiences online. We're not just trying to deconstruct the ideology. We've been testing what I might call psychosocial messaging. And we tend to find across the board, and this by the way is not just if we're engaging with neo-Nazi audiences, but also for engaging with audiences at risk of jihadism, that these audiences are, are more receptive to psychosocial messaging, which gets at their underlying emotions, their feelings of anger, isolation, loneliness even, then they are receptive to ideological counter narratives. So I think there's, first of all, a lot of learnings we can take from across Europe around the, the kind of infrastructure that's needed to respond, but then we should also be applying those same lessons online.
Thanks so much, Vidya. Um, Colin, Molly, would either of you like to talk a little bit about the recent responses in the US and the UK? You've certainly both written about responses in the US um, and we do, you know, to Vidya's point, the report does try to take stock of some of the measures taken on both sides of the Atlantic internationally and see, you know, what are some of the lessons we can learn, but that's also a key recommendation. Um, but Colin, Molly, would you, would either of you like to talk a little bit about the solution side? this. Well, why don't you go ahead and then I'll follow you up. Okay, sounds good. Well, I think that that's very important to note um, following 1-6 where we are today and, and the response and the assessments from intelligence community law enforcement, as well as um, the Biden administration uh, in, in, in moving to address this threat. Um, first, I want to note uh, that we do have a domestic terrorism strategy, the first of its kind that was published by the Biden administration. A uh, great step in, in the right direction. Uh, there, um, there are some shortcomings of the strategy, but I think one thing that's very important to note that it did very well, uh, which Vidya alluded to, is taking an agnostic stance when it comes to the ideology. So the strategy was simply concerned with people using some form of ideology, whether it's far right, far left, Islamist, or you name it, but the, it was concerned with the violent manifestation of that ideology. And I think that is incredibly important when we think about lessons learned from um, our past 20 years of counterterrorism um, policy and strategy, not to overreact, not to over uh, militarize uh, the response, right? Like we don't, we need to be very careful in our approach to not alienate the citizens that we're trying to, as Vidya talk about, uh, trying to uh, prevent them from becoming more ingrained into uh, this hateful ideology and mobilize towards violence. So that's number one. I think the, the latter part that I want to note here is that there's still this outstanding debate, and I'm not pushing for one side or the other, but I think we need to note that it, one of the biggest differences if we look at the United States and the and the UK is the designation of, of, of domestic groups, right? In the UK, you, you designate and you prosecute for domestic terrorism. In the US, it's far, the burden of, is far higher, and there is, um, people have called for the need for a domestic terrorism statute. The strategy fell short of offering any form of indication where the Biden administration might fall down on that, fall on, on either side of the fence for that. Um, and at least I would like to see some efforts by the executive branch to work with Congress in at least establishing hearings on Capitol Hill with experts who are both proponents and opponents of such a, a statue so that we can move further into at least addressing whether there is a need or if current legislation can be tweaked to address some of the what law enforcement feel are shortcomings that don't allow them to do their work um, in, in this space. Um, but I'll, I'll let Colin follow up uh, on, on some more. We've written a piece on, on assessing this uh, strategy, and but I want to say it's a great step in the first direction. We just need to keep tweaking it and making sure that where it falls short, uh, it, new and innovative solution can come to the forefront. Thanks, Ma. I'll pick up where you left off, which is really, you know, we've heard from a lot of folks that we interviewed uh, on the U.S. side of the house that there is a need for a domestic terrorism statute. And this paper doesn't take a stance and we don't take an institutional stance on whether or not there should be um, a statute. Certainly we're aware of uh, the risks and uh, you know, a lot of the kind of potential blowback in that space. But I, but I do agree with Molly. I think you know, we're a democracy. Let's have hearings on the Hill and let's, let's hear from experts on both sides because there are some really smart people on both sides and, and let's make a decision on this. Um, and, you know, we talk about the global war on terrorism. One of the things I hear from opponents of a DT loss is, oh, you know, the government's just gonna take the, the global war on terrorism and bring it home. And I don't think uh, that's the intention at all. I think uh, there are some valuable lessons that we could learn from the global war on terrorism, including how not to overreact and how not to uh, deal with specific communities we did a lot wrong during the last 20 years. We can learn from that, but we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as it were. Um, 
I would say, you know, too often in the U.S., we get into this binary mindset, and you see it right now with this discussion over, are we doing counterterrorism or great power competition, as if it were impossible to do both. Um, it, I'm seeing the debate take place with, with, within CT. We're doing DT or IT, right? Domestic terrorism or international terrorism, but we can't do both. Um, we can do both, we must do both, and we should do both. Uh, and in fact, the closer you look at domestic terrorism and international terrorism, the more you realize there are connections there. Uh, and these connections are, are growing over time. Um, the, the last piece of it, and, and I don't have an answer to this, it's just an observation. You know, the, the way that we talk about domestic terrorism has been politicized. Uh, and that's something that we've seen firsthand uh, with our own experts testifying on Capitol Hill. Uh, people feel like they're being attacked if you say far right extremism. Well, I'm a Republican, so I'm right of center. So you're talking about me. No, we're talking about violent extremists. We're not talking about, you know, individuals from certain political parties. But too often, you know, we've become tribal in this country and, and partisanship is at a record high. And so we're looking at, you know, these things through a partisanship lens. And that's really detrimental to the social fabric of this country and frankly, to the security uh, of this country. We didn't look at similar forms of terrorism through that partisan lens in the past. And the fact that we're doing so now, we look at everything through a partisan lens, including vaccines. Uh, and so it would be my plea to, you know, our elected politicians uh, to please look at this uh, in a way that doesn't include that, that partisanship lens, because that's the only way we're going to begin to to make progress. I know it's unlikely, but I can still, you know, plead for it. Thanks, Colin, uh, for injecting that note of hope uh, into it. Um, I think that, you know, much of what we tried to look at in the paper are some lessons learned and aspects that have gone uncovered. You know, the, the, the question of gender and misogyny was beyond the scope of the paper to go into detail, but we certainly take a look at that because one of the lessons we learned in 20 years is we didn't pay attention to about half the population um, and, and what they were thinking and feeling and doing. And the fact that some of them were doing multiple things at the same time. You know, I can't tell you how often I've read reports on the role of women as it's a, as if it's some kind of singular role that, that women play in extremist movements. Um, and I think, you know, we, we did try and note that lesson learned that we need to think a bit more about things like gender. We need to think about community stigmatization and the lesson learned. And I think that, you know, certainly as we talk about the risks and the opportunities associated with a domestic terrorism statute. I think the example of the UK is quite valuable. You know, it's not transferable identically and necessarily here, but the idea that prevent goes through an independent review or, you know, is, is expected to go through a, an independent review every number of years with a published kind of outcome, the fact that there is sort of an independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. I mean, sure, we can't trans, you know, translate these models everywhere, but it's important to note, and we try to recognize um, some of these lessons learned, um, including the lessons that prevent itself learned in the UK from, from the multiple reviews, you know, like the 2011 expansion to, to include a bit more explicitly all forms of terrorism uh, to the inclusion of community groups and local government and channel panels um, to, to offset some of the worst um, kind of experiences. Before I turn to Tim Wilson, though, for, again, for those of you who haven't had a chance to re uh, read the report, I did want to go into some of our recommendations a little bit so that you get the sense that, you know, we've, we've tried to look at the problem, look at some of the solutions in different places and really identify a couple of concrete action oriented recommendations. You know, some of them may require longer term investments and some are a bit more uh, near term gains. And so some of the things we've looked at are the need to invest in better research and analysis and building on lessons learned from practitioner communities in the states that have sort of successfully dealt with the threat. Uh, Vidya, you mentioned Europe. So, you know, the Radicalization Awareness Network, practitioner communities like Nordic Safe Cities, the Strong Cities Network, you know, there's tremendous knowledge there. Um, and we need, need to think about building on it effectively. Uh, we do talk about the importance of developing a national framework for prevention in the US and the importance of having a national framework that you know, local government and local efforts can sort of plug into. And we raise the prospect of designations as foreign terrorist organizations where we see foreign chapters of US-based groups. Um, we've talked a bit about the value of prescriptions in the UK. 
So we do talk about the need to assess the impact of these prescriptions and also investing a little bit more in disengagement programs and civil society initiatives. You know, one of the things we've seen over the years is an